Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome again to our weekly Bible study. And today we come to the end of, it's been an interesting study on the life of Elijah. Uh, and just by way of introduction, next week we're going to start a series. And I don't know how long it's going to last. It could last definitely into the fall, looking at Paul and the, the people that he came in contact with. And I've really have enjoyed pulling together some material for that. But today we want to finish our study of Elijah. For those who are new with us, we've let's do a quick review here. Um, three and a half years earlier, Elijah um, was began to prepare for this ultimate contest. Um, he went to Ahab and told him that there was going to be a drought in the land. And sure enough, there was. And after three and a half years, there was this contest between the prophets of and the priest of Baal and the prophet of Jehovah. Um, during this three and a half years of preparation, God sustained Elijah by hiding him east of the Jordan River. And then later on, a widow and her son took care of him. When they, the contest came, we looked at this several weeks ago, God showed himself strong as the fires consumed and then the rains came, um, which was incredible because for three and a half years, there had really been a drought in the land. But it's typical in most of our lives, after there's this, this incredibly emotional high, there's also an emotional crash. You know, sometimes we all want to sleep for a week. Some people just want to go and not talk to anybody for a week. Well, Elijah, I think, picked the second one. He decided not to see anybody because he runs for his life. Jezebel gets word of what happened to all of her priests. And so she puts a bounty on his head. And so Elijah runs for his life from Jezebel. He despairs for his life, feeling isolated, feeling alone, and he actually literally was alone, which really um, made the, the situation much more difficult. What did God do? And we talked, started talking about this last week. Well, first of all, God had him rest, and then he feeds him, and that's an important part of recovery when we go through these very down times after emotional highs or despondency that sometimes comes our way that we make sure we get our rest uh, and we make sure that we, we're eating well. I didn't mention this last week and I somehow missed it, but as I was preparing again for this week, going back reviewing, I ran across this of where Elijah ran. I said he went down to the land near Beersheba, but actually the scripture tells us there was a specific location he went to. He went to the Mount Horeb area. Now, we know this mount by a different name. And if you know the story of Moses, you know about this story because this is the Mount Sinai region. And so this is where Elijah runs for. He's way up north, up in the Mount Carmel area, it's in the northern part of the, the land, and he flees and he runs for his life. He leaves the northern kingdom. He tra tra traverses through the southern kingdom which is the tribe, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. And he comes down into the Mount Horeb, this place that was a place that God had visited the people during the Sinai experience while they were in the wilderness. And it was there in this area around Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb that he goes into the cave. And we looked at last week what God said to him. He asked him a question, Elijah, what are you doing here? And of course, Elijah's response is so typical of our response. We start telling God of all the credible things we've been doing for him. And that's what he did. He says, I was jealous for you, God, and now I'm a wanted man. This, this, this isn't fair. Life's not fair. And oh, by the way, I'm the only one serving you. Hey. And so he's feeling lonely, isolated. And as we said last week, is when we get into these periods that we feel like this, we totally lose perspective. We're the only one that can, are there any sane people in this world? It's like watching the news. And after about 30 minutes of the news, we say, are there any sane people in this world? We're feeling like we're, we're all by ourselves. Well, Elijah was feeling this. And of course, then we, we looked at last week that God brings the wind, the earthquake and the fire, but God is not in the midst of them. Now, I mentioned this last week without the understanding that this was the, the land proximity where all of this earthquake and fire and 
thunder took place, it was out Mount Sinai. And of course, this was part of their heritage, part of the memory of the people is that God had met them there in the fire, in the earthquake, um, there on Mount Sinai and, and, and in the wind. And yet, what God is saying to Elijah is that that's how I met with the people when they were in the wilderness back after leaving Egypt. But that's not always how I talk. And that becomes an important lesson. I think back in my life of how God has guided me and, and led me and, and times when God was very special to me. And I, I think back and if I'm not careful, I assume that God will always meet me in the same way. And I have to, I've, had, I've had to learn, not once or twice, but many times, that God sometimes desires to do a new thing. He, got, he desires to lead me in ways I'd never been led before or to, for me to see things that I hadn't seen before. It's, it's kind of like if, if you read the Bible on a regular basis, you can read a passage of Scripture, and you've read it a hundred times, and all of a sudden, that day, that moment, you read it, and all of a sudden, you see it with fresh eyes. You see it new perspective. Well, this is what's happening to Elijah. He's seeing God from a fresh perspective. He, he knew God with the thunder, lightning. He had actually witnessed it just days earlier when the fire came down and consumed the sacrifice. That was the God that Elijah was familiar with. And all of a sudden, God says to him, but I want to speak to you in a still, small voice, in the quietness of your heart, in those times of reflection. And so he speaks to him in this quiet voice because Elijah is wanting judgment to come upon the people, particularly Ahab and those that were following. Okay. But God was wanting to do something greater than just bring judgment. He wanted people's lives to be changed. He wanted to speak a word into their life, not just bring judgment. And so he asks them again, once he declares this truth that Elijah may have not been familiar with, Elijah, what are you doing here? And that's at this point is when he gives him his the third element of, of what he wanted him to do. First of all, he had given him rest. He had given him food, but now he gives him an assignment. He gives him an assignment. And it comes in two parts. The first part of the assignment was, Elijah, I want you to go back the way you came. Now, we don't know exactly the path he took, but if he followed the main routes, you could probably map that out. He wanted him to go back north. He wanted him to go back to the northern kingdom. This is going to take him days, if not weeks, to traverse this, this journey. But I want you to go back, and I want you to be faithful to, to, to continue to declare my truth. God wants his people to be de witnesses of his truth, but also to, when appropriate, to declare his truth. So, Elijah, go back the way you came and be faithful. And when you go back, here's the second part. I want you to do two things. I want you to, to anoint Jehu. Jehu is going to be the instrument that God uses to bring judgment on the house of Ahab. He's going to eventually start, he, he's going to stop the house of Ahab. Ahab and his dad had ruled, and Jehu is going to start a new line, a, a new house of leadership within the northern kingdom. And so he's going to go as the prophet. He's going to anoint Jehu as the successor to Ahab. And then second, he's going to go find his own successor, his own successor. I share this with my students as often as I can. Your leadership in any organization is largely determined by what happens after you leave. Now, I didn't say the greatness of your work because leadership and work are two different things. I lead people to, to, to do the work or I do the work myself. And so there's lots of people who are very capable in doing the work, but they don't know how to lead others to do the work. And so it's part of leadership. Leadership is always preparing people to take your position. So when I would hire managers, senior managers, directors at Phillips, 
one of the first things they had to do was begin start looking within your department for possibility of people that you can nurture, mentor, and coach to possibly replace you. They may not, but we're going to prepare them for their next assignment. And you're going to be the instrument that we're going to use to help them grow in their career. Well, Elijah is given the assignment, basically, go and anoint Jehu, who's going to be the successor for Ahab, and there's going to be a person you're going to find to be your successor because your days are coming and you're not going to be with us much longer. And who's going to be the prophet to the people? So that's an important that I want to close before I move to the next slide. When you and I are in these moments of despondency, eat well, sleep well, and do something that will make a difference. In other words, do something with purpose. Get outside yourself. Because when we're despondent, our world gets real small, real small. And so what Elijah is being forced to do is think outside his own. Okay, Elijah, the only person, I can't really change your thinking on that, but let's go and start doing something and, and make a contribution uh, to society. So what does he do is he finds Elijah. We're going to talk about this burn the boats. Now, as, as I was researching this, I grew up the fact that Cortez had been the one that when he landed with his Spaniards, when before he attacked the Aztecs there in Central America, as soon as he got his soldiers off, he had them burn the ships, basically saying, listen, we're, gonna, we're here for one purpose. We're not going to run for it when things get a little tight because we're stuck here. We're stuck here. But I found out that Alexander the Great did the exact same thing when he attacked the Persians. He had, he had a navy, and when he got his army off the boats, he also had them burn because he basically said, we're not looking back, we're going forward. And so we're going to see Elisha, who is Elijah's successor, he's going to burn his boats. So let's look at the story. So again, Elijah's given this assignment to find someone to mentor. And so he finds this man by the name of Elisha. Now, I always wish that they would change the, the names drastically because as a boy, I always got the stories of Elijah and Elisha mixed up because I never can remember which one. The jaw comes before the shh, and that's, that's the only way I can remember, but that still didn't help me sometimes. Well, Elisha is this obscure person living near Damascus, and he's plowing. Now, if he's got 12 yoke of oxen, it means he's probably not impoverished. He's probably in pretty good shape financially. He's got a business. He's got 12 oxen, and he's out prepping the land there. And Elijah comes along, and he wears a mantle. Kind of, you know, ladies, it would be a scarf for you, but it's a mantle for him, something that kind of a wrap around him. And Elijah comes up to Elisha because God speaks to him, and he casts, he puts his mantle over Elisha, a sign of God's calling. And so Elisha now has a choice to make. I always say this, when someone comes up to me and says, I've got a word from the Lord for you, I always get real nervous <laughs> because I want confirmation of that. I want confirmation. And many times God has had sent people into my life who are confirming something that I've been feeling in my spirit or the reverse has taken place where I say, Lord, if this is of you, make this plain. Lord, just may there be confirmation. And, and God has always been faithful to do that. So Elisha, he's got a choice to make. Do I, do I follow Elijah or do I continue running the family business? And so he makes the decision to leave all. So he takes his secure paycheck. He's now going to follow this wandering preacher around the countryside, and he sacrifices. He burns his bridges, which tells me he probably is the owner of those 12 oxen because I can't see him burning his dad's oxen. So he's old enough that he's burning his own uh, inheritance from maybe from his dad, and he literally is burning his bridges. There's no going back now across this bridge because my livelihood is done away because I basically just sold it. <laughs> well, he burned it. He burned it. Reminds me of a couple thoughts from Scripture. There's a, we actually sing a chorus. We are to offer ourselves as living sacrifices, Romans 12, 
verse one. We offer ourselves, okay, as, as living sacrifice and forsaking all to be a Christ follower. Jesus did this of his disciples. And, and, and so we see the Elisha is paying a huge price for his commitment to follow Elijah. He truly burns the boats. I remember when I was finishing up my engineering degree and we had just gotten married. I was my senior year. It was a five-year program because I was working at General Electric uh, for th the middle three years while I was finishing up my engineering degree. And so we had just gotten married going in my senior year and Judy comes to me and says, Dwayne, you're sure you're supposed to be an engineer? And I told her, I says, God controls thunder and lightning and he knows where I'm at. So if the three ever get together, we'll talk about it. That was my way of deflecting the issue. Month pass, Judy says the same thing. I give her the same answer. Well, by the third month, you know, I, I'm not, I may be slow, but I'm not totally dense. I figure something's going on here. So I asked Judy, where's this coming from? And I won't go into the detail because it's a very fascinating story, but I, I digress here a little bit, but we, we put kind of a fleece out before the Lord. The Lord honored that fleece and it became clear that he wanted me to, con to strongly consider going into the ministry. But I made a decision to finish up my senior year and get the degree. And I remember thinking that last semester about I'm walking away from stability. <laughs> Judy is going from a life, you know, chemical engineers were pretty, they were well paid back in the 70s to being a pastor and probably going to be a youth pastor, which meant instant poverty. And, and I wasn't seeing a real upside to this whole discussion. And I'm thinking I'm walking away. And I thought uh, I should cover all my options. But I had this feeling in my spirit. The Lord is saying, no, I'm leading you. I want you to move in this direction. Now, I didn't burn any oxen. I didn't burn my diploma. In fact, I used my diploma to get my job at Phillips many, many years later. Um, to, to help a home missions church, and, and God used that. But I remember going through what Elisha must have been going through. Of course, he was doing it in a condensed time frame about what is he walking away from. And this was a big commitment. This is a huge commitment. But you know, all of us have been there when we do what God calls us to do. In our, there's such a peace that fills our hearts, even though sometimes on the outside it that doesn't look like it was the smartest decision in the world. God honors our obedience and our faithfulness to him. Well, Elijah then anoints Elisha. Once Elisha makes the commitment, he anoints him to be his helper, and he ends up becoming his friend. And now Elijah knows is living out his purpose. He's kind of broken free of that despondency that he had been living for a number of weeks. The story all of a sudden just changes drastically when you're reading through the Bible, because now we go back to Ahab. Ahab had a neighbor outside the palace by the name of Naboth. He owned a vineyard near the palace, and it must have had just a credible view. It was a, just a prime piece of property, and Ahab thought it would make a great vegetable garden. Okay? And so he goes in to negotiate and trying to purchase this land. But Naboth refuses to sell his inheritance. Now, we don't appreciate this maybe as much, although if you've, got, if you've been third and fourth generation farmers, I think they can appreciate the story more than most of us can, is that when something's been in the family line for generations, the idea of giving it up is so, so difficult. Well, in the biblical times, once that land back when Joshua was in charge, had been given to the tribes. They were responsible to keep it in the tribe, to keep it in the family. This was, in essence, their inheritance. What they did with the land and everything else, you know, that, that was just kind of frosting on the cake. But the land was incredibly important. And so his response was something that made sense for a person who took the law seriously. I am not going to sell you this land not going to say this lamb. And so he refused to sell his inheritance. Now, Ahab is greatly upset, 
But rather than do something about it, and we again, we see his personality here, he goes home and pouts. And he's probably going through and he's kicking the dog and he's kicking this and he's just, oh, oh, oh. You know, Jezebel comes in and says, not having a good, good day today, are we, Ahab? And he goes on and he tells Jezebel this story. And so Jezebel says, leave it to me. I'll take care of it. You can see Jezebel is the one that gets things done. If you want something done in this kingdom, you don't go to the king. You go to the queen because the queen makes it happen. And so she takes control, takes care of it. She gets the, the vineyard. How does she do it? She recruits and hires two false witnesses that lie that Naboth had been cursing God and cursing the king. And of course, this was forbidden by the law. And so the elders, who were kind of like the tribunal there, they were hearing these complaints, and they're in on the scam. And so Naboth, Naboth, Naboth gets stoned because he is cursing God, blaspheming God, which was Jesus' same accusation that was brought against him, except they didn't stone him. They crucified him because the Romans did the killing there. And so without any regret, any remorse, no consideration of life, she goes, kills the man who owns the vineyard, gets, you know, practices greed. Here we see greed at work. We see injustice taking place. And she gives her husband a gift. Here, Ahab, I've taken care of your problem. Now you can go plant your vegetable garden. Okay. Well, God speaks to Elijah and says, we're, we got to do something about this. So this is the last time Elijah confronts Ahab. And this is his third occasion. Remember, the first one was at the beginning of the drought. Then when we had the contest on Mount Car Carmel, and now we have the third time. And God, God's had enough. And so Elijah tells Ahab, in the palace where the dogs licked up the blood of Naboth, the dogs shall lick up your blood as well. A little graphic there says, basically, the way you treated Naboth is the way you're going to be treated. Now, don't view these as domesticated dogs, because dogs in biblical ancient times were wild dogs. They, they were not a whole lot different than wolves and this type of thing at, at that time. And then he goes on to say, because you, Ahab, have sold yourself to do evil, I, God, will bring disaster on you, consuming your descendants, making your house like Jeroboam. Jeroboam, remember, was always the standard of evil in the northern kingdom. So he said, I'm going to make my, and what did God do? God brought judgment on Jeroboam's house. God is saying to Ahab, just like God brought judgment on Jeroboam's house, he's bringing judgment on your house because you have caused the nation to sin. Well, that's bad enough, but he gives him a third part to this. Further, dogs are going to eat Jezebel. So she's not out of the woods here. And his offspring, pretty graphic judgment that was coming. Because that's exactly, they had no regard for life. And God basically saying, hey, you, you're going to be treated just exactly like you treated other people. Now, again, I never saw this before. I've read this passage. I don't know how many times I must have been either sleepwalking through this verse or I just glossed over it because I was so into what was taking place. But Ahab's response is absolutely profound. Scripture says, according to he, 1 Kings chapter, I believe it's 21, that Ahab repents of his ways puts on sackcloth, and he goes into a time of fasting. This wicked king, who was even more wicked than Jeroboam, after he hears this judgment that's going to come, it finally penetrated his thick skull, and he repents of his evil ways. Anyone else ever see that before, or am I the only one that, that glossed over that? Okay, never, never, did you saw that before? Yeah, just like Manasseh, who was another wicked king of the south. Now, God noticed 
his response. See, God's not wanting to judge. He's wanting us to change. And that's exactly what God was looking for. He's trying to get Ahab's attention all along the way. And Ahab's heart was hardened and wanted nothing to do with it. And finally, for some reason, it penetrates and he responds in a way that God was looking for, a repentive heart that says, hey, I'm not the center of the universe. The world doesn't evolve around me. That God, you are greater and I have been wrong. And so because God noticed that, he tells Elijah, because of Ahab's response, the disaster will come, but I will delay it and not in his lifetime. And so he was not going to see in, during his life all of these evil consequences and uh, 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 judgment that was going to come. It was going to be delayed. And, and we see this as a pattern throughout the Old Testament, that when the people would turn back to God, God would say, judgment's coming. They would respond in repentance and everything else. And God says, I will hold my judgment. So as long as they were looking to him, as long as they were trusting him, as long as they were focused on him, God held the judgment back. And we know that they would go back to their old ways and then judgment eventually would come. Now, Ahab dies shortly after this incident. So as far as we know from Scripture, Ahab ends his years in a repentive heart towards God. Jezebel, now there's another story, okay, another story. But Ahab appears to have least changed his ways in the last part of it. And it's funny because as he goes in the battle, Somebody randomly shoots an arrow in the air and accidentally hits him, and he dies in battle. So he dies. And because he's not dressed as the king, they're not sure who he is, he ends up kind of his body out there, and the wild dogs do come and, and prey on his, his corpse. Okay. Now, what happens to Jezebel? It's not part of the Elijah story, but just in case you're wondering, her day comes. It happens many years later. Jehu, remember that guy that Elijah anointed? He's now a general. He's now beginning to take care of all of his enemies, so he's not solidifying his power. And so he goes to the palace where Jezebel's at. He tells the servants, throw her out of the window. And, of course, at that point, they realize that Jehu is going to be the leader of the future, and so they obey him. They disregard Jezebel, who's, I'm sure, giving them an earful about what they should do. They throw her out, and they just leave her here, and the Scripture ends with the wild dogs coming and attacking her. And so she, the, the word that God had given to Elijah actually comes to pass. Now, glad that's not the end of the story because that would be a very depressing story. So what happens towards the end of Elijah's life? Elijah spends his last days traveling with his new traveling companion, kind of like Paul did. Paul, Paul had traveling companions throughout his ministry. Elijah did at the end of his ministry, and it was Elisha. Okay, And while they're there, they go to, this is a paraphrase, they went to the local Bible colleges. There was a Bible college at Bethel or Bethel, and there was one at Jericho. And so as they were traveling throughout the countryside there, they would go and they would meet these, these, the school of the prophets. There was a, a local school there that was teaching them how to, to be prophets, how to be leaders, uh, kind of like a preaching school, Bible school. Okay. And he, so that's what they were doing to encourage them um, to share with the people. And at one point during this little tour that Elijah's on, he tells Elisha, you know what? I'm coming towards the end here. I don't have too many more days left. Just stay here and maybe stay with the school of the prophets. Okay. You know, I, I'm not going to be around much longer. It's just me. You know, you start taking over the school. Maybe you can mentor some of these young preachers. Um prophets, whatever, in the things of God. But Elisha refuses. 
He does that on two different occasions. And after the second occasion, finally, Elijah says to Elisha, what do, I, what, what do you want from me? You know, I, I told you to stay here so that you can be influential and impactful. And Eli, Elisha says, I want to get everything I can from being with you. Think about, have you ever known a person that if you could, you would love to spend as much time as you could with that person just to soak their thoughts, ask them questions, and just share? I can think of one or two people that I would just love to do that. Well, that's what Elisha is doing here. He said, I, I, I don't want to miss a moment because exciting things happen, Elijah, when, when, you, you know, when I'm around you. And I want to see those things. And so what does Elisha ask for? He asked for a du double portion. Now, this is the same level of inheritance that the eldest son got from their parents, okay, from the father. Is the oldest son always got a double portion, got double whatever the rest of the kids got. And so in essence, he's saying, hey, listen, I, I, I want to do the things you're doing. I, I want to be able to impact people. I want to be able to, to talk to God. I want to be able to, you know, when I pray, things happen. I, I want a double portion. Paul, order. You think, isn't it, aren't you asking a little bit much? I imagine if he had asked for a triple portion, God would have honored it. But he asked for a double portion. And so what does Elijah say to him? If you see me when I'm taken up, wait a minute, aren't you going to die? Everyone dies. When you see me when I'm taken up. And so Elisha goes. Now, what happens just before this final event? They've got to cr cross a little river. And the river is running. It could have been during flood stages, whatever. But it's not something that you could just walk across. And so Elijah takes his mantle, and he hits the water, and it parts. Now, they had just run into 50 of these Bible school seminary students, and they're watching this take place from afar. They, they saw this take place, and I imagine their, their mouths open. Wow, God is with Elijah, and Elisha's right there. He's where, he's where it's happening, and they, the waters part, and they cross the water. And they're just having a dialogue. And, and again, it says, if you see me go, well, when are you going? He didn't know. But when you see me go, God will answer your request. And, of course, we know about the chariots of fire. Now, it's interesting. I was doing some study on the chariots of fire. And um, lots of different interpretations of what it meant. But one I found really fascinating that really spoke to my heart was this idea that for a moment, Elisha had insight into the spiritual world. And how do I know this? Elisha later on, because we're not doing a story on Elisha, so I'll tell the story now. Elisha, when he's older in age, he's with his servant. And they're, they're down in the valley. And the servant comes running in out of breath saying, Hey, Elisha, we're in big trouble, or you're in big trouble because there's an army. The Syrian army is around the house we're staying in. And Elisha goes out, looks around, says, yep, you're right, big army. And then he says, oh, God, open his eyes to see the bigger picture. And all of a sudden, the servant's eyes are open, and he sees, yeah, he sees the Syrian army, but he sees a host, a heavenly host that's there. And the, the idea of host is the idea of army. You know, when the angels came uh, to announce the birth of Jesus, there was a heavenly host. It was an angelic army. Okay, the idea is it's a military term. And so I, I see the same thing playing out here. All of a sudden, Elisha, and he's going to, this is going to happen again in his life, gets a glimpse into the spiritual realm. Those of us who have been walking with the Lord for a while, we're, we're fully aware of the fact that there are things that we've seen and there's lots going on that we don't see. Hey. And we see this in the story of Job and we see this others throughout Scripture. And so, again, Elisha 
He's, he's all there. He sees it. And as that host comes down and takes Elijah, translates him out, he sees it. Now, if I was doing a movie of this scene, uh, this is how I have Elisha. I'd have him jumping up and down. I can see, I can see, I can see, I can see. Okay. He's wanting everyone to know he can see. I saw it. I saw it. I saw it. And then all of a sudden you see the fluttering of the mantle as it's coming down as Elijah left the mantle. And it falls from the sky. And what is the first thing Elisha does with Elijah's mantle? He goes back to that river. And he says, double portion. Lord, is this for real? I think partly out of curiosity, partly out of faith. He says, if it worked for Elijah, God, if you're the same yesterday, today, and forever, if it worked for Elijah, it's going to work for me, and I'm going to do it. Now, I, the scripture doesn't tell us that those 50 seminary students that have watched the first parting took place. I wonder if they saw the second parting. We have no idea that they saw the chariot, but I think they saw Elisha walk back across that river. Incredible story. What's Elijah's legacy as we close up today? Number one, Elijah was a man who was bold. He was not afraid to stand for God and stand even alone for God if that's what it took. There was a boldness that he had. Reminds me of a conversation I had with someone at the school this week, and we were talking about parenting because um, he w I was asking him what he'd like my class to do to help with the school in terms of a project. And he says, could we somehow figure out how to get the students to take more responsibility? Because we still have parents doing all the paperwork, parents who are figuring out their schedule, and the kids are not taking responsibility. Okay. I'm not so sure there's anything the school can do because that's a parenting issue. But uh, that, that's another story. And, uh, and so we are talking about what he sees with parents today and everything else. And he said, you know what? There are two ways you can parent. And when he spoke, I said, I, I could agree with him. You can help or build boldness in the child, or you can build safety in the child. You build safe children, they'll never be bold. You build bold children, they'll always be safe. And I thought, I like that. Boldness. Boldness. Now, sometimes boldness roughs, rubs people the wrong way, and I get that. But the point is, is God wants us to be bold for him. To take God at his word. Take him seriously. When God says something, let's be people who are bold. Number two, let's be people who know how to pray. Before every miracle, he prayed. Before God did something, he prayed. I truly believe that God could do things without our prayer, but he wants us to pray. He wants us to have intentionality in our focus and in our prayer. Three, he was a person of faith. He trusted God for the necessities of life. He took God seriously. He was an obedient individual. He was bold. He prayed, strong faith. He obeyed. The fifth one, he was also like us. You know, the first four, I could say, I, I, can't, I can't relate to Elijah. And yet the scripture is very clear. The book of James in the New Testament says that Elijah was a man just like us who wanted to do great things for God, but he was prone to despair. just like we are sometimes. But what stood him apart? Not because he had despondency. I think that's kind of comes with the human territory or not desiring to do great things, but because he was a man of God, a man of prayer, a man of obedience, which led me to reflect in, on this question as I close today. Anyone watching my life and saw how I can relate it to my creator God, would anyone want my God from the life I live? Does my life model the things? Is there a, a boldness in walking with him? Is there an earnest prayer time for him? Faith, obedience, okay? 
Do we take God seriously? Would anyone want my God if they watched my life? And so because of that, again, I'm challenged by Elijah's legacy, his legacy. I want to thank you for being part of this study. And I trust that even though it wasn't a long study, that we, we picked up a few things that got you thinking about our own life. Because again, I, I don't want Bible studies just for us to think about the Bible and to hear about the Bible, but I want it to reflect on the Bible and begin making appropriate application in our own life. I know that as I continue to walk with God and I study and I, I see things, uh, I, I'm motivated. I'm saying, Lord, you know, just help me. Help me to do more than I've done in the past. Granted, we, I have limitations that we all experience, but there's things I can do. And so quit worrying about what I can't do and, and say, Lord, help me to do the things I know to do. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for the life of Elijah. That he was like us. He wasn't a perfect individual. He went through periods of despondency like sometimes we do. But Lord, his focus was always back to you. So when we hit those moments, Lord, may our focus be on you. May our focus be on others. May we get outside ourselves. May we trust you. And Lord, may we continue to make a difference in our corner of the world. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Have a great, great day. I look forward to seeing you next week as we begin our new study on Paul and friends. God bless you.